Hello? Oh, OK. So it's working. Um, thank you guys for coming and attending this session. Hopefully, you guys can take something back with you, and uh, that will help you in your uh, work every day or maybe in the next six months. So let me introduce myself. My name is Utkarsh. I work for Tinder right now uh, as a senior engineer. And uh, I have worked in the past for Sony PlayStation, uh, built their uh, global monitoring system using Spark and other open source tools. So we, we're going to go through that today here um, in, in this uh, presentation. Also, I've been an active contributor to Grafana. Uh, if you are in the monitoring uh, domain, then you must have heard about Grafana. Um, and last year, I presented in GrafanaCon as well. So this is just a small background about me. And I would like to thank Spark Summit for giving me an opportunity to speak here in front of everyone. So monitoring, why is it really important? Obviously, monitoring gives us uh, more visibility about our systems, about our apps, websites, or whatever product which we are selling out there in the world. But more than that, what monitoring also helps us in preventing these kind of situations where users are impacted because of outages. So this kind of experience is not really good for the business and the companies which we work for. So we want to avoid these kind of situations by having better monitoring, better alerting, and better predictability, predictability about uh, issues which are about to come. So let me take you guys three years back when a guy called Jack was hired at Sony PlayStation. Don't miss the story, because if you miss a link, then you might not be able to catch up. So let's stick to Jack for now. So he was given a POC, a proof of concept, to work on, on monitoring with some, uh, with some requirements, like 5,000 unique metrics, some data points. I mean, the data points were coming every minute. Uh, data retention should be about for 60 days. And it a, a good UI should be there. So what he thought about POC, um, is that there should be a metric source coming to a time series database uh, and going through the visualization layer. So this is a basic architecture what he thought about. So, but he has a very smart friend called Google. And he searched on that, like what he should be doing. So he searched about time series databases. He searched about a visualization layer. And he compared the time series databases because he had choices. So he chose Graphite because that was the most popular one at that point of time. And I mean, and the community also supported that. So he chose these two components and designed his perfect architecture for proof of concept like this, which is metric source sending uh, metrics to Graphite and then visualizing the metrics in, Gra in Grafana. And POC was completed. The requirements were met, and everybody was happy. Gra dashboards were up. But when he did this and showed everybody in the company that he was able to provide a metric visualization platform or a monitoring platform, then all other teams also wanted to pro, uh, get their metrics uh, monitored and uh, to be added in the same visualization platform so that, so that they can correlate all the metrics coming from different parts of the systems together and uh, find out the issues together. So, uh, but then his POC architecture won't scale for these requirements. So now there's a problem, how to scale? Scaling problems are there. Now, there were a lot of things going in his mind when he was thinking about these problems, whether he should scale Grafana, whether he should scale Graphite, because his POC architecture just consisted of just two things, Graphite and Grafana. So what he did, he went back to his, I mean, he, he thought about his school days where he was taught a strategy of divide and conquer. Uh, so he chose like, okay, I'm gonna go with first team at least and try to satisfy them. So he chose first team and looked at their requirements and looked at his POC architecture. Can that handle that? Um, so the team requirements were these. So what he did, because Grafana supports multiple data sources, he brought in another layer of uh, team's metric source and graphite and attached the same Grafana on that. So now you have a combined uh, visualization layer, but you're having metrics coming from different sources, which you can see on the same platform. And team one was conquered. Everybody was happy. This strategy is working. Let's bring on other teams. So team two, let's see their requirements. More number of metrics and more data points. So let's use the same strategy. Bring in another graphite. Bring in another data source, which is from team two. Plug the Grafana into, in, into it and see whether it works or not. So team two conquered, not really because the requirements were too high and the scale was, which was required to provide the visualization for those metrics was higher. So what failed? Graphite failed right there. 
So what he did, because he's, he's intelligent and hardworking, he never gives up. So he goes back to his smarter friend, which is Google, and he searches for how to scale graphite because graphite failed. So he read some article about clustering graphite and stuff and made this complex architecture. And what he does with this is he's going to replace the single node graphite with the cluster and see if the, uh, if, if the requirements are met for team two. So team two conquered? Not really, but maybe for a month, that's it, because graphite scaling dynamically is hard to do. Um, so what he did was, um, sorry, what he did was he searched for alternatives to graphite. A couple of them at that point of time were OpenTSDB and InfluxDB. He searched for InfluxDB and read about it, but there was some monetization plan going on with InfluxDB, so it was not free, or it was not, uh, the clustering was not free for open source. So he discarded that because he doesn't want to spend money on paying others, other companies. Um, he wants to stick to open source because company is pay, uh, his company is paying him money. So he went with OpenTSDB, but there is a big problem with OpenTSDB. It doesn't come alone. It comes with a whale, it comes with an elephant, and a zookeeper to handle those animals. <laughs> but he is hardworking, so he took this, I mean, this big uh, infrastructure and replaced the cluster with that. Team 2 conquered? Yes. Finally, he was able to satisfy Team 2's requirements using OpenTSDB and its scalability because of Hadoop. Now let's bring Team 3. And it has a lot of million, I mean, it, it has three million logs per minute coming in. He wants to process those logs and generate metrics out of it in near real time. So that's his goal for Team 3. So what he does, he goes back to Google and search how to process logs at scale. Right? We write questions in Google. So he found a couple of things. One is Kafka. If, uh, if someone doesn't know about Kafka, Kafka is just a message, messaging tool which we can use for uh, queuing and, and I mean queuing messages or even for publishing and subscribing messages. So it's like a big uh, traffic jam where messages or cars are entering from one side and coming out of from other side. And other is Spark to process those logs which are coming into Kafka or events coming into Kafka. Uh, Spark we all know because we are here, um, but I will still say it's a parallel processing engine which can do things in parallel as simple as that. Dr. Octopus. Um, so he went with these two components, put it into his pipeline, where he, he's sending logs to Kafka and Spark. Uh, Kafka is just retaining those logs for maybe seven days or three days, whatever is needed, and then Spark is pros processing those logs and sending the metrics in near real time to the OpenTSDB stack. So it looks like this is working. So Team 3 conquered? Not really. But because one day what happened was the animals were acting weird. So things failed, uh, which happens in real life scenarios. So, but he, there was, uh, I mean, he was, he, there was an idea which came into his mind because of this that, okay, I have logs in Kafka, which I can reprocess through Spark and generate those metrics. So by this idea, but he was not able to uh, process, reprocess the metrics coming from team two because they are going directly. So what he did, he, he remodeled his architecture, sent all the metrics and even logs via Kafka and Spark now to, to the time series databases. So this is the fan in, fan out model, like things go, coming back together and going out um, and supporting the scalability which is needed to provide a scalable platform, scalable monitoring platform. So th that is what he came up with at the end. So all the metrics and log sources which he dealt with were these, and maybe more than these. Some custom uh, log sources and metric sources were also there. So these are mostly open source, except obviously AWS, because they charge us. Um, but, but he tried to do as much as possible open source and not spend too much money. But there was a new problem now. Too many sources, all different formats, and more Spark streaming jobs for different kind of formats. So if you look at how a Spark, or, uh, how a Spark streaming job is written, uh, it's like somewhat like this. This is just like a hello world of Spark streaming from um, GitHub's code right now. So what he did, and he has to do this for all different kind of data sources or the, new, uh, or the uh, metric sources which are coming in different formats. So he might have like 20, 25 Spark streaming jobs running in parallel to process different kind of sources. So what he did, he wrote a small 
a, a wrapper library for writing Spark streaming jobs, so you don't have to declare every time like which Kafka topic to read to, or which SQS to read to, or which Kinesis stream read to read to. And now he can do stuff in that much amount of line. The same code can just run in those amount of line of code, and now he can uh, write more Spark streaming jobs very easily, writing from this library, which he has written, which just does all the initialization which is needed for uh, for Spark streaming jobs, where to read from and where to re write to, and that's about it. So what this is an overview of the library, how it is. Like he, there are a lot of like input beams and output beams. Uh, you can write your own beam if you want to write to Cassandra. If you want to write to Redis, then you can have uh, just extend the the main base output beam, and you can just have your own as well. Uh, you can read from something customized. Uh, like an HTTP source or something, you can have that kind of beam as well as an input beam. So this is more like uh, you can have different input sources and different output sources in the library. How it works is you just define it in a JSON file and pass it as an argument to the Spark streaming job. Um, you just define the name of the beam, uh, duration of the job, how it is, uh, Spark settings. Uh, if you want to have, give executor memory, driver memory, all those things you can define in here. Then you define the input settings, like you want to read from Kafka, the topics, the Kafka connection parameters, and then output you want to write to a socket, which is a graphite or something. So you basically define everything in a JSON and just pass this as an argument to an, a, an object called laser, and that's going to just initialize everything and give you two arrays of input streams and output streams. And then you can just play around with that where, wherever you want to do calculations, like either in map, map phase or reduce phase. So Laser is open source now. It's under uh, my organization. Uh, this is the good news, but the bad news was, uh, bad news is, is that this, wa this was written back when I was, or when Jack was in, um, um, <laughs> <laughs> when Jack was in PlayStation. So I, th that's a proprietary uh, thing for Sony. Um, so I'm rewriting this um, because I took that idea from Jack. And it's not complete yet, but you guys can help me complete it, and we can make Spark streaming uh, jobs easier. And uh, it can help everyone in the community. So he, these are some numbers which were um, being, I mean, which, which Jack's pipeline. Um, so about 3 million unique metrics were um, created and deleted all the time. 11 mi uh, billion data points were written per day. All these numbers are there. Um, these, this was um, actually uh, done by the fanning in and fanning out uh, pipeline, and this was monitoring the global scale of Sony PlayStation. So lessons learned from Jack's um, work at PlayStation. Strategy, which is divide and conquer. Think small, so solve smaller problem, and then you might get to the bigger goal. Second is look for alternatives always. There will be something out there uh, which we can find. Um, scalable components, that's really important because uh, if they don't scale, then you might have to wake up at 3 a.m. and do something manually. Um, so you don't want to do that. And um, automation, because you need to have auto scaling in place because if the uh, traffic increases at night or in some country, which might affect your system. Um, Traffic can increase any time, you never know. Somebody might be hitting, I mean, some bots might be hitting your service. So the things should be in place with automation. Uh, we should be reusing components. That's why that laser library was written. Um, you can use any SDKs which are provided in open source. Common artifacts can be used. And, and these things are really helpful to have a scalable monitoring platform like this uh, with Jack built. So, what, um, so this is what, what is keeping PlayStation's user happy, but this is a good learning for myself, and now I work for Tinder, so I can keep my Tinder users happy and implement the same strategy there. And you guys can also uh, imp use the same strategy to help your company and your users, which you're supporting. So this is the end of my talk, which, is what, which, is, which was very short, and we are hiring, uh, so you can contact me. And if there are any questions, um, I would be happy to answer. Okay, this concludes all of the talks uh, for today's session on streaming at Spark Summit. Uh, we'll open up the floor to Q&A. Okay, yep. So 
What are the differences and similarities with like Pepper Data and differences and similarities with Pepper Data? They they claim to have the same uh, high level monitoring and so on and so forth. Uh, the Pepper Data thing is uh, actually monitoring the Spark jobs, right? But this is actually monitoring any of your component. You can just monitor your backend servers, your caching layer, your database layer. You can send those metrics in the same um, pipeline through any source and just monitor them together and have a consolidated uh, visualization platform in Grafana. What's that? Including Spark. So Spark sends its own metric to Graphi and things like You can send it to Kafka as well. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Utkash. Um, I was curious about your auto scaling uh, stuff. Do you have to do, uh, were you able to auto scale your Spark streaming jobs? Or more importantly, were you able to down scale your Spark streaming job? So, for scaling Spark streaming jobs, uh, I'm using EMR right now. So, the cluster is able to upscale and downscale. I think that's a downscaling is a new functionality by AWS. But uh, for jobs specifically, uh, on Yarn, it's, uh, Spark supports the dynamic allocation. So, you can just use that. Mm-hmm. Right, so I have faced that problem too. So I still use um, some jobs uh, with the old uh, receiver-based approach when I use it with Kafka. So I can run jobs in parallel, and the receiver-based approach can like handle those failovers, and it should be fine then. But if you use direct streaming, which is a newer thing, but then uh, what is that called? Uh, backlogging happens when there are a lot of events and logs. And uh, if you want to scale down, then sometimes the dynamic allocation is not perfect, right? So you can still go back to the old, old uh, RRD usage, uh, which doesn't hurt, and it still works. So we don't have to be really up to date. If something older works, we can just use it and make it work. Any other questions? I think we are good. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you.